Hello, welcome. Just give everybody a few minutes to log in and log on. All right, it's a couple minutes past, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, just a note that uh, today's session is being recorded um, and that the materials will be made uh, available uh, after today's session. Uh, so my name uh, is Jeanette Hatherell. Uh, I'm the Senior Coordinator for Coalition Publica, and I'm joining you today from the unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg, and just up the road from uh, the Kitchisibi, which is the great river uh, that connects to other great rivers like the Gatineau, uh, the Rideau, uh, and it feeds into the St. Lawrence. So today, as we're kind of talking about uh, interoperability between systems and people and organizations. Um, I'd just like to take that sort of theme of connection with us um, and thank everyone uh, for joining us um, and invite uh, everyone here to just kind of uh, take a moment and welcome and reflect on the generosity of everybody kind of showed up today uh, in a spirit of uh, reciprocity and sharing uh, that I think we're as um, communities are trying to kind of cultivate in this uh, open access and diamond open access space. I invite you to share in the chat uh, where you are coming from today, uh, if you would like to. Um, and also note that that's where you can interact with us uh, throughout the session today. Um, so we have plenty of time for Q&A um, at the end, um, but you can definitely add your questions into the chat and into the Q&A feature, um, and we will uh, get to them uh, uh, at the end, or I will use my description as moderator to potentially interrupt if there's something that needs to be um, immediately clarified by one of our presenters. Um, I'm overjoyed <laughs> that there are so many of you who have signed up and uh, tuned in. Um, maybe we found the elusive one day in the academic year where everybody uh, is free, but uh, more likely than that, um, than that sort of random magic, uh, I'm pretty sure that it's thanks to our wonderful speakers who have agreed to join us today. Um, work that they've been doing to advance ORCID uh, in their respective environments and organizations. So without further ado, um, I will stop my screen share and I will pass it over to John Aspler to get us started. Over to you, John. Thanks so much. All right, let's just share this and then remove the annoying floating meeting control gray boxes. There we go. All right, so uh, hi, everyone. I'm delighted to be presenting first here. Um, I have a, a unique position, I think, when it comes to talking about ORCID in that, sure, I'll be talking about a specific use case at the Canadian Research Knowledge Network, CRKN, but we also run the ORCID Canada program as well as the Datacite Canada Consortium and lead the development and implementation of a national persistent identifier strategy for Canada. My role is as a Canadian PID uh, identifier community manager. So um, I just want to take a little bit of time to frame some of the discussion. Uh, I know you all know what ORCID is, so I'm just going to give a very brief high-level strategic overview of the vision. Uh, I want to talk briefly about PIDs in Canada. I want to talk about where we are on the development and implementation of a Canadian PID strategy and where ORCID fits into that, and then ultimately dig into that specific ORCID manager. So what is ORCID? Uh, you all know that it is a global not-for-profit organization, and they understand themselves as providing three core services. The first is ORCID identifiers to individual scholars for free. This is, of course, a unique and persistent identifier for people, and its core function is to disambiguate each scholar from each other. The second is the ORCID record. So this is the... Um, the list of scholarly activities that connect together the individual ORCID ID to a list of, say, DOIs for research outputs, or a list of ROARs, Research Organization Registry Identifiers, for affiliation information, for example. 
And then ultimately, on the other end, we have the ORCID API, Application Programming Interface, that enables the interoperability of metadata about scholars and their scholarly activities. We see the ORCID ID as the individual service to the scholars, and the API ultimately as an institutional service because as a not-for-profit, to be sustainable, ORCID requires institutional membership. That's why the ORCID Canada Consortium exists, and it enables institutions to connect ORCID to their systems, which ultimately helps the lives of scholars themselves as they can then connect their scholarly activities to your system. And this is the big picture, interoperability. This is the goal. Every stakeholder takes the responsibility for the information they manage. Employers like university asserting, adding affiliation metadata to a scholar's ORCID record with their permission. Publishers adding publications and other kinds of research outputs and funders adding funding information. And of course, it's not just about adding to a researcher's ORCID record, them in the center. It's also about enabling scholars to pull information from their ORCID record into your system. We're not here yet. This is the grand vision for the future. This is potentially the huge time saver. This is potentially what enables ultimately the backbone of open scholarly infrastructure. So where are we in Canada? Well, we have, as I said, an ORCID Canada consortium. This includes well as a number of major funders, including SHRC, NSERC, and the FRQ in Quebec. On the Data Site Canada side, we have 70 members. I, I won't be talking about that much, of course, other than to say that the C that CRKN manages and runs the ORCID CA Consortium, while Datacite Canada is a partnership with the Digital Research Alliance of Canada, the Alliance. And ultimately, they're not just a partner in running one of our two PID programs, they're also a partner in the fact, the sense that they are the funder for the PID program. They fund, they, they provide fee offsets for our members, they also provide the funds to develop and implement the national PID strategy. And this is a project that is done centrally with the Canadian PID Advisory Committee, the CPADAC. Uh, I won't go into who is uh, there other than to say uh, Susan Haig is the current president. Um, Kevin Stranick is the vice president, or I should say vice chair and vice chair. And uh, it is a committee made up of a significant number of major research stakeholders across Canada. In terms of the Canadian PID strategy and what is ORCID's uh, part in that? Well, the first thing I'll say is that people often ask why we need a national strategy. And my answer is usually that um, the national helps us connect the local context, the institutional context, the provincial context, to the international context, which is where all of the persistent identifiers play. All of those organizations, ORCID, Datacite, Crossref, ROAR, they are international not-for-profits. Um, PIDs are a collaborative and Endeavor. They connect things together. And because of that, we need people to work together and, again, take on responsibility for the particular entities metadata that they themselves control and the systems that they themselves control. The other answers are, are kind of simple. Um, funding. Funding happens often at the national level to drive PIDs internationally. We need to do this nationally. And also there are national policies like policies around open science that uh, PIDs can help us uh, support and that ultimately drive forward the open science initiatives. We've done a lot of work over the last three years to develop and start implementing concurrently a national PID strategy. So just to briefly give you an overview, I'm sure many of you have heard me say this before. In 2021, we started with a very small scale project, CRKN, the Alliance, the CPADAC committee, uh, hired an entity called More Brains, More Brains Cooperative, to a roadmap to a roadmap. It was helping us identify the preconditions to success. What do we need to do to make the development and implementation of a national PID strategy happen? Phase three ended in 2023, and that was largely the development of a series of communications items, a communication toolkit, which included an item that we've developed in-house called the Roadmap to Success. We know that a PID strategy is going to be a long-term iterative process of developing, implementing as we go over many years. Uh, but we also know there's a lot of easy things that individuals and all kinds of stakeholders can do now. None of these are published yet because we're going to be publishing them along with the outputs from phase three, which we literally just wrapped up last week. We have a vision mission statement and a set of principles that are helping drive the development and implementation of the PID strategy. We identified eight priority entities with more brains help. They did a significant amount of consultation, focus groups, interviews, uh, workshops, etc. So eight priority entities, the things that Canadian research stakeholders wanted PIDs applied to. And this most recent phase has enabled us, or they, they've developed a report to identify which these. Really, phase three is where things start cooking. This is where we concretely say which PIDs apply to which entities to resolve which problems. 
And one of the things I want to highlight here about ORCID is that there was never a question that ORCID is the PID for people. We were not doing a bunch of work and ultimately saying, ah, it turns out ORCID isn't the gold standard. We de facto knew without a formal strategy that ORCID is and is going to continue to be the gold standard for a whole bunch of reasons that, that I've already highlighted. So really, this is helping us connect ORCID to all of the messier parts of the PID ecosystem, the things where we're not sure which PID among competing PIDs might be winning, or even how we can connect these things meaningfully together at this stage. What kind of systems do we need or what kind of integrations do we need to build to connect ORCID and other PIDs meaningfully together? So that's really where our next steps come in. Uh, these are very vague next steps. We are going to act on the report recommendations, for example, and share our materials materials widely. And that's because we've really come to the end of what I, I think is a coherent three-year project as we leap into the next phase of PID strategy development, which again, will always be centering ORCID because ORCID is for scholars and ORCID is also the way that we and institutions connect together in a giant web of connectivity and interoperability. So with just two minutes left, I'll talk briefly about CRKN's use case, specifically the way that we are imagining using a tool called the ORCID Affiliation Manager. Every institutional member of ORCID or ORCID Canada or any ORCID consortium gains access to a tool called the ORCID Member Portal. So CRKN is itself a member of the consortium that we run. Inside the portal, there are two tools, live member reports. If you are an institutional member, you would like to see those reports. Uh, the affiliation report is really where you wanna be looking. That's where you can see all of the scholars that have publicly affiliated themselves with your institution, reach out to me. Let me put you in touch with the people who are managing your ORCID membership. Um, this might be very, very useful for you. And the second tool is the Affiliation Manager. This is an administrative tool that ORCID built with the specific goal of reducing the burden to entry to integrating ORCID into your systems. Because many institutions, even if you're a member of ORCID CA, don't have integrations or maybe don't have the funds to connect ORCID to a giant vendor system that your institution doesn't, doesn't currently have or is thinking of getting at some point in the future. So the Affiliation Manager is not a technical tool. It is an administrative tool that enables you to use a CSV file to upload in bulk thousands of affiliations to ORCID to then enable you to ask permission from your scholars to add those affiliations to their ORCID record. So this is what the ORCID member portal looks like for us as we land on the CRKN landing page. This is what the affiliation report looks like. Uh, again, we are a very different entity than a university. So ours has much smaller metrics and many fewer and different kinds of affiliations. But I do briefly just want to highlight what kinds of affiliations exist to add to an ORCID record with the affiliation manager. We've got employment, we've got education qualifications, and we've got a series of affiliations called professional activities. That includes invited positions, distinctions like a student award that might not be recognized in another way or in another place, membership in a society, and service like on a board. Uh, I realize I'm coming to the end of my 10 minutes, so I'll be brief here. Um, this is what the Affiliation Manager interface looks like on the web UI in the member portal. You can see that you can import affiliations from CSV. That's where you upload your thousands of affiliations. Those are my affiliations with CRKN. So on my ORCID record, I have added my employment to CRKN. And it has a nice big green check mark here to lend legitimacy and enhance trust. It also enables the consistency of the entry for CRKN in people's ORCID records. I really wanted it to be bilingual, that's very important. I really wanted it to include the acronym CRKN and RCDF in French. That is not available if I want to add CRKN from the drop down menu when I go to type out the affiliation, uh, unless I want to do it manually, in which case it's not being counted properly because it's not affiliated with a ROAR identifier. So using the affiliation manager, I was able to make consistent and better the way that CRKN is represented for employees at CRKN. But the other big use case is board membership. This is a really interesting one for CRKN because we only have 30 employees at any, any given time. And some of us aren't scholars, so they don't necessarily need ORCID IDs, but we do have many, many, many committees. We have three persistent identifier committees, the ORCID Canada and Datacite Canada Governing Committee and the Canadian PID Advisory Committee. So to date, we have added, I guess I can go back here, you can see all of the orange in the right-hand side. Those are all service affiliations for boards. I have added all of the affiliations for our board members on the ORCID CA and Datacite Canada Governing Committees, the current membership. It's going to be pretty easy for me to go back and add all of our past members, as well as to do this for the CPDAC. And we even have some other CRKN board members who've started adding this themselves. And so I reached out to them to say, hey, can I can I make this formal with the nice big green check mark, you know, legitimizing and recognizing your service on our committees. 
Uh, so I'll end there. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, uh, John, and uh, I appreciate the, the the tight timelines that I've given you all. But we do have great speakers, and so we wanted to make sure that we all had all had time and time for Q and A at the end. Um, Seeing no immediately present questions, I'm going to turn it over now to our pals at PKP and uh, over to Eric to talk about ORCID uh, at PKP. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Eric Hansen, and I am a software developer with PKP. And today I'd like to give you a little bit of information about the ORCID integration with OJS. And oops. Uh, to start with, just in case any of you are unfamiliar, OJS stands for Open Journal Systems. And just a few fun facts to kind of wet your whistle of what it is beyond uh, an academic article journal publishing platform. It is the world's most widely used open source journal publishing software. It is available in over 50 languages. And as an added fun fact, in 2022, there were more than 44,000 active journals using OJS worldwide. So this is mainly here to just provide a little bit of context of the scope with which we're working in the context of OJS. But I want to do a bit more of a deep dive today on now that we've had a high level overview of ORCID at large, what does it look like in the context of OJS? So how about the ORCID integration with OJS? So to start with, it integrates primarily with the editorial and production workflows. And what this means in practice is that once you have the ORCID functionality enabled, it worms its way into all the different aspects of the publication workflow. So there will be points in time where at the beginning, when a submission has just been submitted, it hasn't been reviewed yet. There are opportunities to associate ORCIDs. And this is the case throughout the entire process. It also allows us to authenticate users' ORCIDs as part of the publication process. So when a submission is accepted, it's possible to then automatically email the authors and anyone who is a contributor on that submission, asking them to link their ORCID to OJS so that one, the ORCID can appear alongside the article, but also so that if they are using the member API, which I will talk about in just a moment, they can have the submission then pass back upstream to ORCID for their ORCID profile. It also enables the ability to display these ORCID statuses publicly on the article landing pages. And it also allows us as OJS to provide the ORCID metadata to downstream services. And we'll hear a little bit more about what this looks like for AUD, but this is also equally applicable to other uh, PID registration agencies such as Crossref or Datacite. And this ends up playing out for OJS in two different ways when using the ORCID API John reference earlier. So there are two different kinds. There's the member and public APIs. So the public APIs, they can be thought of as these are available for anyone to use. You can create the credentials directly from your ORCID profile, and these allow you to read things from the ORCID service. So OJS uses this to both authenticate users' ORCIDs and display them within OJS. There's also the member API. And to have access to this, you need to be part of the ORCID membership. And this allows you to then effectively write data to ORCID. So it allows OJS to push verified contributors, updates, submissions, reviews back up to ORCID so that those can appear in a user's ORCID profile. And when John was showing an example of, I believe it was his ORCID profile with the green check marks, this is another way that those can items can be added along with the green check mark saying, this has been verified as coming from an authorized source where the user has said that is who they are and it's coming from a verified publication. And to give you a little bit of an example of what this looks like in practice in OJS, I'll give a little live demo interlude. So I'll go over to an OJS test install and we'll go through this pretty quickly, but I just want to give you at a glance what this type of thing looks like. So the first thing, the ORCID functionality is a plugin within OJS. Uh, OJS has a very rich plugin ecosystem 
And some of them are created by third parties and some of them are managed by PKP ourselves. This is one that is managed by PKP and is included by default, so it doesn't need to be installed, but it does need to be enabled if we're going to use it. So come down here and find it, or could profile plugin. And I just want to highlight a few quick things under the settings. Um, one, it can be enabled at either an individual journal level or at the entire OJS installation level. Here, I've chosen to do it at the site level. Um, one, because it lets me hide my client secret, so I don't have to reset it after the webinar. But two, it allows you to use all of the same credentials across the entire suite of journals under one install. There's one other thing that I want to highlight on here in particular, which is this email settings. So one of the things I referenced earlier was the ability to automate this as part of the publication workflow. So we want to send an email to request ORCID authorization from authors when an article is accepted. I'll show you what this looks like in just a moment. So let's go back up and find an example submission. We'll take one that is in the submission, submission stage, which means an author has submitted it using OJS, but it has not been sent to review or declined. So for our purposes today, we're not talking about the OJS workflow in detail. So we're going to just skip the review altogether, assume it's been accepted. And with a little luck, we will be able to go to our email and see a, a request to authenticate the contributor, Rosanna Rossi's ORCID. So we'll go over to the email. And we do have an email requesting ORCID record access. So here, you have been listed as an author on this manuscript submission. Please allow us to add your ORCID ID to the submission and also to add the submission to your ORCID profile on publication. This is the functionality of the member API. If you're using the public API, this wording will be a little different and the functionality will be a little different. But the core idea of register or connect your ORCID ID to this submission in OJS will remain the same. So we'll go ahead and do that. I'll need to log in. then go through the authentication process, and then we'll arrive back in OJS and see that my ORCID authorization has been successful, has been verified and associated with the submission. And then to go back to the editorial view, so working as the journal editor, if we go back into that same submission where we just were. We can look and see that indeed this ORCID has now been verified and associated with this contributor. We'll then skip ahead in the publication process as well, assign this to an already published issue and publish it. And go to the article landing page for this. We see that indeed the ORCID has been linked here. You may notice that in my examples here, it's, we see sandbox.orchid. That's because I'm using the test instance because I'm rapidly adding fake articles and removing fake articles, and I don't want to be diluting the actual record of someone's orchid, including my own. But I can take you here to the orchid record. We see that the submission that we just went through was indeed added, and the source with the green check mark is Open Journal Systems Orchid Integration. And it says dev here because that's what I'm using in order to do testing, but it will say whatever the authority that has access to the member API credentials. And finally, just as a little demonstration of what is relevant to some of what we're going to hear about next, this is the OAI interface. So this is what allows other downstream services to take content from OJS. I'm going to find this article that we just did to change the format to be the one that Coalition Publica and OUD uses. We'll zoom in. Most of this isn't relevant to this demonstration, but I do just want to highlight that we now have our ORCID here present alongside the author information, as well as the fact that it has been authenticated, which is the most important part about this. And I'll reference a little bit of that quickly. I'll come back to my slideshow talk about what's coming next for the ORCID integration in OJS. So I'll just hit a few quick highlights about what's coming up in OJS 3.5 in terms of ORCID. 
So previously, as I mentioned, the ORCID functionality was a plugin and it is now being integrated into the core application of OJS as well as OMP and OPS. Um, this allows us to one, maintain it as a core feature and not have it be a separate plugin that needs to be maintained separately, but it also allows for deeper integration with the rest of the systems throughout the application. One example of this is it's going to be integrated into the upcoming user invitation workflow, which will allow either people who already are involved with an OJS install to be added as a new role or allow external people to be invited to a journal. And it will have the ORCID integrated so that they can add their ORCID immediately as part of that invitation process. Some of the other changes will be being able to call greater attention to the authenticated status of the ORCID. So we already saw a little bit of that in terms of the uh, OAI interface I just showed, and that it flagged the ORCID as having been authenticated. But one problem is historically, users have been able to add an ORCID as free text. And so we were removing the possibility of adding an ORCID altogether as free text input in forms for the ORCID. So what this means is moving forward, users will only be able to add an ORCID or editors for that matter, will only be able to add an ORCID by inviting the user to authenticate it directly and add it to their profile so that we will then be able to know that not only is this ORCID here, but if the person to whom it belongs has added it directly. So that's been a little overview of the ORCID functionality in OJS, both taking things from upstream and sending things downstream. Thanks so much. Thank you, Eric. And thanks for that uh, live demo. Uh, it's always brave to do live demos and that one worked beautifully. So uh, good stuff. Um, seeing no immediate questions either, um, we'll move along to our Palisata Erudzi, the other, the other half of Coalition Publica, uh, and I invite Matthew to uh, share his screen and tell us a little bit about ORCID implementation at Erudzi. Okay, one moment. Okay. Yeah, hi, I'm Mathieu Pigeon. I'm coordinating the implementation of ORCID at Erudzi, and today I will present to you our ORCID project, what has been done and uh, what is coming up. I, was, I wanted also to uh, say to Eric that he was brave uh, to make a live uh, demo. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, before we start, here's a little introduction on who we are for those who don't know us. Uh, so, we are a leading platform for disseminating research in the humanities and social sciences in Canada. There are currently uh, 245 active journals on Erudi, and we support open access publishing and research. Last year, we had uh, 5 million users on the platform and we are a member of ORCID Canada. So our uh, ORCID project is aligned with the national efforts in Canada to implement uh, PIDs, uh, as uh, it was uh, discussed earlier in John's uh, presentation. Uh, what has been delivered so far? So since November 2023, we support ORCID IDs on the platform when they are uh, provided to us by journals. Um, we have to pipelines uh, with which we process ORCID IDs. Uh, the first one is our OGS EVD integration, a production tool that is used to disseminate the 100 or so journals, uh, coalition, sorry, coalition publica journals on the EVD platform. For these journals, uh, the ORCID IDs are retrieved automatically from OGS metadata, uh, and the status of ORCID IDs is uh, also retrieved if uh, available, so uh, if it is authenticated or not. Uh, our other production tool is used to create the uh, digital versions of article for approximately 140 journals on the platform. These journals, they send us their production file, for example, PDF and Word documents, and uh, we retrieve manually the ORCID IDs from the source files uh, when they are uh, provided uh, by the journals. Uh, and so uh, the status of 
our kid retrieve uh, this way is uh, always unauthenticated because of the way they are uh, obtained. Uh, so far, we have collected uh, 928 ARCID IDs, so since November 2023. Of uh, them, only 210 are uh, authenticated. These numbers are low because uh, right now only OGS can provide us with authenticated IDs. And uh, But until recently, uh, the status of uh, an ARCID was not uh, recorded in the metadata. And so to have uh, this information in the metadata journals on OGS 3.3 and 3.4 need to update their versions of JATS template and OAI JATS plugins, uh, two plugins that are uh, uh, needed for Coalition Publica journal. So they need to update these plugins to the latest versions uh, available in the plugin gallery. And uh, we, uh, of course, recommend uh, the Coalition Publica journals uh, or the person that manages their uh, OGS instance uh, to update their plugins before the end of uh, the year. Uh, this will al uh, allow us to retrieve the status of uh, the ARCID IDs for both uh, upcoming articles and those that have already been uh, harvested and disseminated on Eridi. After 2024, we will no longer update uh, automatically the status of ARCID IDs found uh, for a already published article. If you update your uh, plugin after this date, uh, you will need uh, to contact us so that we can uh, retrieve the status. Uh, here's an example of an HTML page uh, of an article on the Eridzi website where all of the authors have uh, authenticated ARCID IDs. In this example, uh, the uh, ARCID icons are green because they are authenticated. Otherwise, uh, they would be gray. This is how we uh, make the distinction be between uh, authenticated and unauthenticated uh, ARCID IDs on the platform. Uh, we only use the icon for the shortlist of authors, but if we click on the more information uh, link, uh, as uh, it is the case in this uh, screenshot, we see the uh, author's uh, affiliation and the compact ARCID ID, so without the uh, ARCID uh, prefix. On the uh, PDF, front page that we generate for all of the articles on Eridzi. We also display the ARCID icons, but only the icons because the space is uh, limited on this uh, page. And for those who want to see, here's uh, how the uh, ARCID uh, IDs are recorded in uh, our XML format. So we can see, uh, like uh, for the JATS, uh, OGS JATS, that uh, we uh, also have the uh, authenticated or not uh, uh, attribute. Um, I will now uh, present to you uh, the project that we are currently uh, working on, which is uh, set to go into production this summer. Uh, yeah, so we are uh, currently working on implementing the claim, which is uh, the uh, ARCID modus operandi for associating an ARCID ID with an article. Uh, with this implementation, researchers will be able to connect to their ARCID profile uh, via the ARCID APIs implemented uh, on the Eridzi website. Once they are connected, uh, researchers that uh, will be on the uh, HTML page of an article will see a claim link uh, that will be only visible to them. So if you're not connected, you, you, like it will be the case for 99% of our readers, you won't have uh, this uh, claim uh, uh, link uh, in the information that you see. Uh, so a researcher that wants to uh, claim an article uh, will need to click on this link and follow the instruction. And once the claim is completed, uh, the article citation uh, will be added to the ARCID profile of the researcher with AVD as the source of uh, the uh, citation. And the ARCID ID of the researcher will be uh, a added to uh, the article metadata on Eridzi. Uh, for uh, ARCID IDs uh, 
obtained this way, the status will al always be uh, authenticated. Um, yeah, that's it for the claim. Now, uh, finally, I will uh, briefly introduce you to our two other uh, projects that are uh, metadata enrichment projects. The first one, sorry, the first one is uh, we want to harvest uh, ARCID IDs by uh, querying the ARCID API using the Eridzi article DYs. Uh, so uh, basically, we will uh, search for ARCID uh, uh, for Eridzi article uh, by using their DYs on, in the uh, ARCID database and uh, retrieve uh, associated uh, ARCID IDs uh, for these uh, articles. So in 2023, before we start uh, the project, our proof of concept return uh, around 5,000 ARCID IDs from the ARCID database. Uh, and these uh, 5,000 ARCIDs were uh, 100% matching. And uh, in 2024, this number has increased to 7,000. For our kids uh, obtained this way, the status will be unauthenticated. And uh, finally, uh, our last uh, project is uh, that we want to authenticate unauthenticated ARCID IDs that will be uh, present in our database. So uh, the, the, the the project is still at uh, its uh, beginning, so we don't know yet how we will do this exactly. But we know it, it's it's possible. We will uh, so we will send an authentication request to uh, researchers via their uh, ARCID uh, inbox. Um, so uh, that uh, because it's important for us to have uh, authenticated uh, ARCID IDs uh, in, on the platform. So that's it for the planned project. We had uh, other ideas, but for now, uh, we will concentrate on this project and see uh, if we need to, uh, if we will continue uh, develop projects. Uh, for example, uh, maybe uh, uh, we will try to retrieve uh, ARCID IDs from Dimension or OpenILX, but for now, uh, we don't know yet. It's not planned. So uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Merci, Mathieu. Thank you very much. Merci. And last but not least, I turn it over to Sonia to talk about University of Alberta Libraries. Great. Thanks, Jeanette. Can you see my screen OK? Yes, we can. All right. So um, my name is Sonia Betts. I'm the head of Open Publishing and Digitization Services at the University of Alberta Library. Uh, we have a pretty big and active publishing program. We publish about 70 active journals. About 45 of those are peer-reviewed scholarly publications. About 25 of them are student publications. Uh, and then we have a whole bunch of inactive publications like ceased journals um, or things like course journals that, that don't really apply for this particular context. Uh, we are ORCID members, again, through the, the CRKN program, um, and lots of our journals are also Coalition Publica journals, uh, and we use OJS. So this is like the entirety of my ecosystem on this call in one place, which is always very nice. Um, so we implemented ORCID uh, across the board globally in uh, winter, so December-ish of 2023. Um, prior to that, we were really having a lot of trouble trying to get uh, our publications in our journals to turn on the ORCID functionality themselves. So we've been watching the ORCID plugin for a very long time um, with uh, envious and covetous eyes. I uh, had heard many uh, presentations from PKP about their development work. We really, really wanted this for our journals. Uh, we also know that the editors in the journals want ORCID. We had many requests for integration of ORCID. Even as long ago as OJS2, there was some ORCID functionality that journals were, were happy to use. Uh, we know that authors want at ORCID for all of the good reasons that other folks have identified here. Um, and they want integration with their accounts so that they don't have to do all of the hard work of manually linking content into their ORCID profiles. Um, so we thought, uh, hey, there's this great plugin available. Um, let's just kind of uh, configure the settings, and then journals will absolutely go in there, turn it on, and start using it. Um, 
So way back in spring 2020, of course, nothing else was happening in the world at that time. So we uh, cautiously configured and enabled that plugin with some partner journals um, and shared a little bit of information about ORCID and waited for them all to just like flood, flood the gates with their implementation. Um, but when we had a look again in December of last year to see how many of our journals were actually using the ORCID plugin, uh, only 26 of 77 potential journals had actually enabled the plugin and were actively using it in the way that we would expect them to. So uh, in fall, we decided to re-evaluate our approach. Um, and we sort of asked ourselves this question, like, was there any reason for us not to globally implement ORCID across all of our journals? Uh, so those of you who are working with uh, library publishing programs probably understand the, the balance that we tend to have with our journals where, you know, we like to support infrastructure, we provide a lot of guidance and consultation, um, but we have a long history of journals being quite independent and autonomous. Um, and, you know, we're always a little bit nervous about doing things on behalf of the journals um, when those things kind of flood into uh, editorial, um, editorial tasks. Uh, but thinking through some of the options here, uh, there were a th few things that sort of led us to think that we could just globally implement this across the board. So first of all, uh, consent is always required by the authors when they're um, authenticating their ORCIDs or linking their ORCIDs to the um, ORCID IDs supplied. Uh, we implement a lot of other infrastructure changes globally without much second thought about it uh, earlier in the year. For example, we turned on the ROR plugin um, and we notified our journals about it, but we didn't ask them if we could if we could please turn it on. We felt that it was our responsibility to do that. Uh, we know ORCID is used broadly by other publishers and be has become sort of an expectation for editors and authors across the system. And then we felt that there were quite a few risks of not actually implementing ORCID. So, um, you know, providing broken or bad ORCIDs within article metadata, um, requiring manual work for editors and authors and updating ORCIDs as needed, um, and really just allowing our system to fully participate in the Skullcoms ecosystem in a way that was meaningful were all um, good reasons for us to think about globally implementing across the board. Uh, so in January, I think it was January, um, we decided to start this little project. Um, what we did was we first ID'd which journals had not already enabled the ORCID plugin. Uh, for all of those journals, we identified which submissions um, were already in progress within those publications and just ensured that they had uh, correctly entered the ORCID IDs into the metadata field. So if the, an ORCID was entered in the wrong format or if it was an invalid ORCID, we made sure to check into those and correct them before enabling the plugin just to avoid any error messages um, up the road. Uh, and then we configured and enabled the ORCID plugin for all eligible journals. So uh, we did it. And then we sent an email to all of our editors saying, hey, we did this thing. <laughs> <laughs> the one thing that we didn't do was enable the email settings that Eric actually demonstrated in his earlier session. And that was our, that was our like cautious, you know what, we're going to just like take this one step at a time. Um, so we decided not to turn that setting on, uh, invited journals to um, turn that setting on and we will support them in that work. I think the next phase of this may be to uh, turn that setting on for a journal so that they are taking full advantage of all of the ORCID functionality. Um, so we're going to have another discussion about that locally here. So we thought again, you know, they're going to be cheering. We're going to get a lot of uh, either very happy or perhaps not so happy customers as a result of this decision. Uh, but like many of the other things that we do within this program, it was uh, we did it. Uh, people used it and uh, it was just kind of part of the business of operating our journal publishing program. Uh, we did have a few fans who were extremely enthusiastic about the integration. So it's always nice to hear from those folks. Uh, but I think it was a bit of a nothing burger for most of our editors. So all of our um, our uh, uh, hair pulling and concern about whether we were overstepping the role that we occupy within this space was probably not necessarily justified. So uh, I think that's probably all that I wanted to say. That was very brief. I ma managed to keep it nice and short so that we have lots of time for questions. So I guess we're going to take questions for all of these presentations. And I've got one, Jeanette, um, whenever you're ready to, to start that. Excellent. All right. So we'll maybe get our uh, presenters to 
turn on their cameras um, and not seeing any burning questions in the chat right now. Uh, of course, if I could open my chat, that would be very helpful. Um, but why don't you go ahead, Sonia, while I figure out my Zoom settings and you can kick us off. Sure, thanks, Jeanette. Um, my question is for uh, John. You mentioned the integration reports. Um, I haven't seen the integration reports recently and, and I'm not sure what data is included in them. Could you talk a little bit about what we would see if we looked at those? I would be very interested in knowing um, numbers, like how many ORCID IDs have we managed to like link or publish or interact with since we've turned on our plugin, but I don't know if you, that data is collected anywhere. That data is definitely collected. That is sort of the core of the ORCID member portal reports. I don't know how many of you have been looking at ORCID metrics for years. Back in the day, uh, once a month, ORCID would send along a Google sheet that basically included one or two points of data. It was a number that represented possibly how many scholars at your institution were using ORCID, but it was not differentiated by students or by employees or anything like that. It was just a number with no uh, information behind it. And possibly it was a little chart that said something about people connecting ORCID IDs to your integration. The ORCID member portal now has three separate reports. One is called the member report, which still provides some overviews, including that number, but it go goes into a lot more detail. The second is the integration report. This is where you're going to see how many scholars are connecting to your instance of OJS or your instances of OJS. So you can actually see a list of the ORCID IDs and names that have done that. And you can also see aggregated data. If you have multiple integrations at your institution, not just OJS, maybe you also have the DSpace integration or you know your research office is using something in symplectic elements. Um, you can separate those out. You can see that information in aggregate or separately. So firstly, yes, if you have people using OJS, you can see who is doing that at your institution. Um, this is interesting because, um, as you probably all know, uh, you don't just have scholars at your institution interacting with your journals. Typically, you're going to have scholars from around the world, if not around Canada. Um, so that's not necessarily going to help you say who at University of Alberta, for example, is using ORCID, but it will give you a sense of who's using your journals and ORCID. Beyond that, the affiliation report, the third report, this is this is the big one. This is sort of the newest report. It wasn't there when the ORCID member portal launched, but it is basically answering one of the top three questions I've gotten for years, which is who's using ORCID at my institution? Maybe the top question is, uh, what are the funders doing with ORCID? But the second question was always, what's going on with ORCID at my institution? So if you have access to the member portal, you can just go to the tools, click on affiliation report, wait a couple minutes for it to load, and it's gonna break down pretty substantively who has publicly affiliated themselves with your institution in ORCID. There are a whole range of caveats that I'm happy to get into at some point, but it does include an Excel exportable list of every single individual line item, uh, not just individual ORCID IDs. You know, I can be both a former student of a university and a current faculty member, and you can then sort it by all of that. You can know who is a faculty, who, who is employed by the university or the institution, who has their education there, who's a board member, and we're talking about services. You can see when they modified this information. So maybe it's not a current staff member because they haven't updated their ORCID ID, ORCID ID since 2018, or they have recently left, or like you can see all of this information it's all broken down there um, there are graphs there are basic metrics and there are these you know thousands long potentially uh, lists of ORCID IDs and users so always happy to answer more questions about that but uh, yeah that's all that's all there in the ORCID portal Sonia you should have access to that directly at University of Alberta excellent Thank you, John. Uh, so we did have a question come in from the audience, uh, uh, a few actually. Uh, so the first question I'll direct to Sonia. Um, so the question is, no journals have had a negative reaction to the plugin being turned on. No journals had a negative reaction to the plugin being turned on. Again, I think it was just a you know, expectation. This is part of what we do as a publisher. Um, I think they see it uh, and I'm just guessing here, but maybe they see it as more affiliated with infrastructure than editorial decision making. Um, so we've had no negative responses, only a small number of positive responses. So I'm going to take that as like uh, a consent to continue uh, doing this kind of work. And uh, kind of continuing on that, um, if you could uh, provide a little bit more explanation about the email setting that you uh, referenced. Uh, can you explain that part again, specifically what does it do when it's turned on? And uh, Eric covered that a little bit as well. So if uh, if you wanted to jump in as well, uh, feel free. 
yeah, I feel like I could softball lob this question over to Eric, who demoed that little checkbox in the settings of ORCID. My understanding is that that sends an email, which is exactly what he showed, an email to the author uh, to ask them to authenticate their ORCID account by logging into ORCID. But Eric, maybe you can just confirm that that is indeed what that does. Yeah, exactly. So there are a couple different ways that an editor or the OJS system in general can basically ask a person somewhere else to authenticate their ORCID. And the checkbox that we're talking about, the text says, send email to request ORCID authorization from authors when an article is accepted, i.e. sent to copy editing. So the checkbox is automatically send an email every time to all contributors when a submission leaves the review stage, basically. Um, there are other ways of doing it as well. As an editor, you can go into the contributor settings and manually click on an author and say, I want to send this person a request to authenticate their ORCID. That can also be a way of, even if you did it automatically, if they say, oh, I lost the email, can you send it again? That's a way to trigger that as well. Great. Thank you. Um, oh yeah, and then there's a, a share in there. Um, the screen cap of uh, the documentation uh, available in the PKP docs hub uh, about using the ORCID plugin and there's some, uh, there's uh, information in there. So thanks to Emily for uh, sharing that link. I was trying to pull it up, but you beat me to the punch. Um, uh, I will, turn it over now to, this is a question uh, for Mathieu, um, but uh, potentially John has some input on it as well, knowing a little bit the bigger ORCID ecosystem. So the question is, hi Mathieu, with that authentication process from ERID-Z that you're hoping to accomplish be similar to the way other databases like Scopus, for example, authenticate works in the ORCID system? I don't know for Scopus, but from uh, what I remember, and uh, John can confirm, uh, I think it is what uh, Crossref is doing. So uh, sending an one message to the author. So we, we, we need to figure if j we just want to send one message uh, for all of the <laughs> articles of the author. So this is what we still need uh, to figure. So John, uh, maybe uh, if you want to complete. Yeah, maybe the, the insight here is that um, there are tools inside ORCID called search and link wizards that let you pull works from external systems into your ORCID profile. And there are tools external to ORCID that push information into your ORCID profile. Sometimes it's sort of a, a weird semantic difference, but when I'm adding something from Scopus, Scopus is not pushing this for me. Scopus is not pu putting this in from the outside. I am going from ORCID to my Scopus account and then pulling back the information into my ORCID record. So it doesn't get the green check mark. It just says, um, you know, John Aspler via Scopus. And what that means is that the metadata is, you know, valid. I'm not typing out metadata that might be wrong. I am pulling in whatever metadata exists in Scopus and I cannot edit it. But it's still not Scopus as a system or a particular journal saying John definitely wrote this. So it's still the author claiming this, which which sometimes, you know, depending on what we mean by legitimacy and stuff, we, we want to say that, you know, the publisher is saying this person really wrote this and not just the scholar is making this claim because, you know, maybe maybe it's not true. Um, there are spam accounts that exist in ORCID. So these are the kinds of things we want to deal with. So what Mathieu is talking about sort of sits a little bit on the other side. It's coming in from outside. It will have the little green check mark. Um, and it's not quite the same thing as a search and link wizard in the traditional sense. You're not going going from the inside, you're coming from externally. Crossref also has uh, you know, both of these things. There is a Crossref metadata search, search and link wizard. I can use my ORCID record, go to Crossref and pull it back. Or if I have been able to connect my ORCID ID to a journal article before the DOI is published and that DO, DOI metadata from Crossref receives my ORCID ID, then Crossref is going to send me a notification to say, hey, we think we found your work. Your ORCID ID is associated with this. Can we add this to your ORCID record? And that will get sent in. And there are all kinds of systems. Sometimes you can log into an external system and just click a button to push it into your ORCID record. So it's kind of doing the same thing as the internal claiming. It's still the, the user themselves, but hey, it's coming from an outside system, so it gets the green check mark. It, it gets messy and complicated, but um, I guess that's that's sort of the, the details that uh, hopefully that was granular enough and, and helpful. <laughs> Clear as, clear as mud. <laughs> um, 
Great. I, I'm not seeing any more questions in the chat at the moment, but um, did anybody want to feel free to raise your hand or unmute yourself if you feel uh, more comfortable asking questions out loud? Sometimes that's uh, the case. Um, so I'll give you guys a minute. But also, I'll just mention, um, uh, going back to those email settings that we were talking about in uh, in um, OJS uh, previously, um, just to note that um, those are based on templates and you can sort of change uh, a little bit the wording of those templates. So if you ever kind of feel that maybe some things are, uh, you know, too, too automatic and you really want to encourage people rather than just sort of have boilerplate, please do this. But, you know, we encourage you to do it because of X, Y, Z. Um, you can always go in and, and modify mo uh, those templates a little bit. Okay, um, we have a comment. Uh, Sonia Metzia, the email settings things was also very helpful. So, excellent, I think that's uh, good. And confirmation that John's answer was also uh, useful and helpful. So that's great. Um, we're getting close to the end of our time. Um, uh, I'll, I'll give, you know, if another question comes in, uh, uh, happy to address it for sure. Um, but in the meantime, uh, I'll just start wrapping us up by maybe um, saying a few words that I realize I probably should have said at the beginning, uh, which is what is Coalition Publica? I, I was so excited to get to our presentation so we didn't sort of give you guys the context of who these folks are and why they're coming together today. So Coalition Publica is a partnership between uh, PKP and Eridzi in Canada to build uh, an open national infrastructure for uh, open access publishing, uh, supporting the transition to sustainable open access. And we're doing it in partnership uh, with libraries uh, like the University of Alberta and others across the country uh, who are uh, so importantly playing this role of, of, of being an infrastructure provider, uh, uh, sage advice, uh, and, and really strong partners too in the financial support that we offer to journals who participate in Coalition Publica through uh, the Partnership for Open Access, which supports um, Diamond Open Access Publishing in Canada. Um, so there's an intro as an outro. Um, I want to take uh, uh, another opportunity to say a big uh, thank you to everybody who was able to join us on the call today as an audience member, but also uh, my deep thanks uh, to the presenters uh, and to uh, you all for entertaining my request to keep your presentations to only 10 minutes. I know all of you could do uh, hour long presentations on, on everything that you guys are up to. So we really appreciate your time uh, with us today. Thanks, Jeanette. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody. All right. Well, lovely to see you all and uh, have a good one. <laughs>